Okay, thanks, Debbie. So we now now got the recording started. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by um, four wonderful people who are going to be our, our speakers today. Um, Jacqueline Creswell, Mary Gregory, Sarah Bourne, and Winifred O'Marker. Um, and so let's have each of them uh, introduce themselves briefly to us. Uh, let's stop going sort of alphabetical order by first name. So Jacqueline, would you like to introduce yourself first? Hi, Alistair. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Jacqueline Creswell. Um, I'm a visual arts advisor and curator, and I've been working in cathedrals over the past 15 years, um, based primarily in Salisbury. Um, and I believe that art has the potential to enlighten us and give us new perspectives. And I hope to show you it has the power to bring people together, to evoke debate, and to be a source of contemplation and inspiration. Lovely, thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, Mary. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Alistair, for inviting me. I'm um, the Canon for Arts and Reconciliation at Coventry Cathedral. I've been in post for eight months, and it's a post new to the cathedral, so we're uh, together sort of shaping what that role might look like. But fundamentally, um, it's very much the subject of this um, webinar this afternoon, how we can um, engage with the arts um, as a tool for reconciliation, reconciling ourselves to, to God, to other people, and also to ourselves. So looking forward to the conversation and um, making notes about what the other contributors have to say. Great. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Sarah. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Alistair, for inviting me to join this group this afternoon. <clears throat> I, um, I am currently the chaplain for the arts based at St Mary's Church in Banbury, which is in the north of Oxfordshire, the north of Oxford Diocese. Uh, I did used to work at Coventry Cathedral, so I know a number of the spaces around this screen. Uh, it's very good to see several of you again. Um, the, the people have asked me frequently, what does a chaplain for the arts do? And um, when I started at Banbury back in February 2019, um, I had to sort of think about how I would, what my role was going to be. And I came up with a strap line, which I have actually used on every single piece of publicity for every arts event, every event I've organized at St. Mary's. Our strap line is, Arts at Banbury St. Mary is our new initiative to bring our community closer together. So we put that on every piece of publicity. And I think that that is where there's the, the intersection with reconciliation is that through trying to uh, build links with the community, I feel there's a, there's a very considerable role for reconciliation within that as well. Lovely. Thank you. Delighted you can join us, Sarah. And I know you're not being brilliantly well, so really appreciate you being with us and, and uh, showing up today. And Winifred, let's hear from uh, have you introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Winifred Amwaka, and I'm, I'm a multidisciplinary artist. And my work primarily focuses on the, um, the scriptures and spreading the word of God. And in terms of today's um, topic, I hope to express the word of God through art and give insight to everyone who is a believer or not, but to like have the insight to express the gospels through their craft and just to you know edify the spirit as well. Lovely Winifred and really delighted you can join us. Um, well as you've probably already picked up um, this webinar is a bit different to some of the other webinars that RI has hosted to date. Those have largely been discussions around a particular topic that connects with RI's work. Um, but I'm delighted today that we're going to be engaging with some visual art uh, and we're going to be thinking together about how the visual arts can both be something of an expression of God's reconciling work and a vehicle for seeing something of that reconciliation uh, in our lives. Um, each of our speakers has selected uh, a couple of works to speak about. A number of these are artworks which have been uh, curated in church spaces, but not all. Um, and in Winifred's case, as she's already um, uh, sort of indicated for us, she's going to be speaking about her, her own artwork. So I'm just going to uh, bring the PowerPoint back up. And we are going to hopefully get our first 
uh, piece. Um, so that what we're looking at is a, 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 a a sculpture which was recently on view at uh, Coventry Cathedral. And Mary, the, the Cathedral's Canon for Arts and Reconciliation is going to tell us about it. So uh, what are we looking at? Um, so we're looking at um, a sculpture by um, Jacob Epstein called uh, Jacob and the Angel. Um, and this was uh, shown at Coventry Cathedral from March to May this year as part of um, an exhibition which we called Epstein's Stories in Stone. And, this really, this sculpture that you can see on your screen was the, the catalyst for that exhibition. John Ardine had seen it in the Tate Gallery where it normally resides and had a vision to bring it to the cathedral. So um, I actually came in just at the glory moment. So uh, the team at the cathedral have been doing all the work and I arrived, uh, I think the same week almost as this sculpture. Um, I think one of the interesting things to say as I begin really is that the sculptures that came for the exhibition joined some permanent sculptures that are always at Coventry Cathedral. If you're at all familiar with the cathedral, you might know that um, Epstein created the sculpture of Michael towering over the devil at the entrance way into the cathedral. And that in the ruins, there's a sculpture of the moment when Pilate brings out Jesus in front of the crowd and says to them, behold the man. And less well known that the door handles on the west screen, the glass west screen are little cherubs um, also created by Epstein, very beautiful. And uh, just to say that the inclusion of those Epsteins in Basil Spence's cathedral was in itself, I think, an act of art and reconciliation. Um, Epstein was Basil Spence's choice to join in with the artist creating the jewel box that is Coventry Cathedral. But in the 1950s, Epstein was a really controversial choice. His work was very often misunderstood and undervalued and often was shown as a kind of a sideshow at fun fairs. Um, but for the Reconstruction Committee, the rather conservative Reconstruction Committee, his ethnicity was a stumbling block. And one of the committees purported to have said to Basil Spence, but he's a Jew, uh, to which, the indomitable Basil Spence replied, well, I think Jesus Christ was too. And um, as often, Basil Spence got his way. So this sculpture is a Epstein's retelling of the account in Genesis chapter 32, where Jacob is preparing to meet his brother again, Esau, uh, for the first time in many years. And the background is that there is no reconciliation between Jacob and Esau because Jacob cheated his brother. And on the eve of that meeting, Jacob sends his entourage on ahead of him and he camps by himself on the bank of a river. And during that night, somewhat mysteriously, he encounters, well, a man, an angel, God, and the two wrestle together until the dawn. And in the course of this encounter, Jacob's hip is dislocated and he's asked to name himself before the angel gives him a new name. And when the struggle concludes, Jacob says that he has seen God face to face, a moment of reconciliation through that struggle, Jacob sees God. I think um, this was an important piece for us in terms of art and reconciliation because the Bible story and the sculpture has a lot to say about what it is to be reconciled to ourselves and to God. And for me, one of the pivotal moments in the Bible story is when the angel insists that Jacob names himself. And he does, he says, I'm Jacob, but that name means supplanter. So in naming himself, Jacob is in a way confessing who he is. My, my background before I was ordained is in the prison service and getting prisoners to be able to name who they are in terms of what they've done is a really key moment in them being reconciled to themselves and in the process of rehabilitation. So it's such a strong biblical story about reconciliation. The story also tells us that to be reconciled to ourselves and to God and to others can be quite bruising and it will change us. Reconciliation, as we all know, is no light matter. And we learn from the biblical account that after this wrestling match, always ever after, 
Jacob walks with a limp. So he has been reconciled, but he has been changed in some ways and it has been costly to him. And he's given, in fact, a new name, Israel, which means one who strives with God. It, in the striving is where the reconciliation comes. So I just wanted briefly to say three ways in which I think this sculpture is really interesting in terms of arts and reconciliation. Most kind of directly, we invited in the cathedral people to engage with this sculpture as a kind of meditation on what reconciliation demands of us. And particularly, as I've already mentioned, the struggle, the effort involved in being reconciled. And you can see from this image here, the sheer physicality of the sculpture, the kind of the heft of the figures, their muscularity. And you can't see it so clearly in this image, but the figures are clearly exhausted. Can you see how the angel is kind of holding Jacob up because Jacob is completely spent? And we use this to help people understand about, you know, the the um, the demands really of reconciliation. If we are to be committed to reconciling with each other, it's going to be a painful and a costly thing. But actually, having the sculpture in Coventry Cathedral um, opened up other avenues where this art became um, the prompt for a conversation about reconciliation. And I particularly love this photograph because it sets this sculpture and Graham Sutherland's tapestry together, kind of in conversation. So Jacob and the Angel normally is in an atrium in Tate Britain, sort of surrounded by whitewashed walls. But with it being in the cathedral, somehow the cathedral itself interpreted the sculpture and the cathedral and the sculpture asked questions of each other. And so just thinking about the sculpture and the tapestry in conversation, one might ask questions like, has the wounded Christ performed for each of us the struggle that Jacob and the angel undertake? Has Christ's death, his journey through thorns, been the means of our being reconciled to God? And another interesting question I think is, who prefigures Christ in this sculpture? Is it the angel or is it Jacob? And certainly you can't see from this picture, but in the tapestry, as in so many pictures of Christ in glory, you see Christ's wounds. So Jacob always limps after he wrestles with the angel and Christ in glory is still showing the wounds on his hands and his feet. So I was really interested about how the location of the sculpture in that particular location raised interesting questions about reconciliation and our understanding of our faith. Um, the second way which might surprise you a bit more, and we could go on to the next picture, Alistair, if that's okay. I'll try and get us there. There we go. The second um, consequence of having the sculpture in the cathedral was that it kind of provoked questions about how much of human experience can be considered holy and therefore reconciled to God. Um, forgive me for speaking directly, but if you know this sculpture at all, you'll know that the figures have uh, exaggerated and prominent genitals. There is most definitely a sexuality about this sculpture. And you might see that a bit from this second picture where one might wonder if the figures are kissing and whether Jacob's head is actually thrown back in ecstasy as much as in exhaustion. As a cathedral team, I think we'd really braced ourselves for the many hundreds of school children that come through our doors finding this aspect of the sculpture hysterically funny. Interestingly, they kind of took it in their stride and it was often adults who asked questions about the sculpture's sexuality and its location in the cathedral. And um, I had some really interesting conversations, one with my atheist brother-in-law, who was really shocked that such a sexualized piece of art would be in the cathedral. But actually, I thought that was a very interesting opportunity for us to engage with people in conversations reflecting on human sexuality, to say that those conversations belong in such a holy place, 
and to challenge some thinking about how we feel we need to exclude matters of human sexuality from um, our worship of God, from our identity as Christian people, and to have the opportunity to have a conversation about how human sexuality is part of God's creation of us. Uh, so they, that was my kind of starter for 10, and I know that other people might want to sort of comment on what I've said, but I hope that gives a little flavour of what we were hoping to do with, with the Epstein sculpture, this one in particular. Thank you so much, Mary. So uh, Jacqueline, Sarah or Winifred, anything you'd like to offer as a kind of response to what you've heard or something that's been particularly striking for you? Jacqueline. Well, uh, firstly, thank you for um, interpreting it for us in, in, in that perspective, because I haven't actually seen it at Coventry, but I have seen it at Tate Modern. But I was just wondering, you know, um, Jacob Epstein, whether this had any personal significance for him and whether it might have been slightly autobiographical. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that it's a sculpture that that bears his name, you know, that he's also called Jacob. Um, and I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know, um, having, I haven't read things that specifically say that, but I mean, I think a lot of Jacob Epstein's artistic life and personal life actually was, was a real struggle. Um, and, you know, I think also that he was very keen to explore questions of human sexuality. He worked with um, E. e. Gill on a lot of work, which was, was kind of quite avant-garde in terms of exploring sexuality. So, um, I, I, I can't kind of quote chapter and verse from Epstein himself, but my instinct would be that some of it would be um, reflecting his own struggles. Thank so, you. Yeah, Winifred, go, go, go. Um, thank you for the explanation and thank you, Jacqueline, for the question, because I was just thinking, because of his personal struggles, do you think this sculpture is more or less of a expression of desire to reconcile with his um, thoughts concerning God? I mean, as, as you said, you don't really know his um, personal life, but do, you, do we, can we view his work as a, as, a, as a yearning to, you know, to find something of meaning of reason for his soul? So that's my question. Yeah, I mean, I think we could see that. And I think also the invitation is for each of us to um, engage with the sculpture in that way. And that's what we were really trying to do with our reconciliation team, both in the diocese and in the cathedral. Um, two Emmas, Emma Crick de Boom and Emma Griffiths ran workshops together, inviting people to engage with the sculpture in those in, the, in those terms to think about um, where they might need to be reconciled to another human being or to God or to themselves. So I think, um, you know, it's hard to, to comment too far on Jacob Epstein himself, but to say that as viewers um, of the sculpture, we were also invited people to kind of participate in it in some ways and to think about, you know, where am I in this struggle? You know, what am I struggling with? What would it mean for me to be reconciled to myself and to others? Yeah, thank you. For me, Mary, one of the things that's most striking, I actually just want to go back to the previous slide. I, I was really struck by how a work of art can take on a new significance depending on where it's located. Mm. Um, because I, I think that the power of this located in Coventry Cathedral is very different to it, you know, where, where it's located in Tate Britain. And that, that that dialogue with the image of Christ is is really, and the reflections you had on that is really striking, but, but it, it it shows how much the context matters for a piece of a piece of work and how you start to see some things in what is happening within the work of art that's different and um, because of the context in which it's placed. Um, yes. yes, and I should have said that this was placed right in the centre of the nave of Coventry Cathedral. So as we were kind of um, in our Sunday processions or as graduations were happening, this was this was right at the heart. You, you know, there was no missing it. and. Um, you can't tell from this picture, but the tones in the um, in the sculpture really um, look beautiful with some of the tones of the of the cathedral. And you know, we were kind of hatching a plot to kidnap it and keep it there permanently. And <laughs> may even have suggested to the Tate that really Coventry Cathedral was the best place for it. But but it but it was fascinating. It was fascinating 
having the sculpture there at the heart of our life. So our life as a cathedral for two or three months, you know, happened around it and, and, and the sculpture in some ways spoke into to the ebb and flow of life in a cathedral. Um, but as I was saying, this, this sort of conversation between um, the sculpture and the tapestry, and if you're at the front of the cathedral, between the sculpture and Hutton's screen at the back, which is a screen of saints and angels, was also an interesting conversation. Uh, yeah, lovely. Thank you, Mary. Right. Well, I think we should I think we should move to our second work. So I'm going to um, sort of uh, take us into this. Uh, so Jacob and the Angel, uh, as we've been learning, is an example of an interpretation or event within the biblical narrative. Uh, we're now going to look at one of uh, uh, or we are looking at one of Winifred's art, works of art, which reflects her engagement with a, a different element of the biblical story, at uh, this time one of the parables of Jesus. So uh, Winifred, tell us about this piece and the connection you're making with God's Reconciling Work. All right, thank you. Um, so this is this work is called The Thoah, and it's a recreation of an artwork that I made during my time at UAL. Um, um, and this piece is a depiction of um, Christ's well-known speeches made during his ministry. Um, as described in Matthew 13, 1 to 23, Jesus spoke of a parable regarding the kingdom of heaven. Um, and to quickly summarize, um, the parable begins um, with Jesus discussing with the multitude of the people about how a farmer sold his seed onto four different services and spoke on how the seeds um, germinated in accordance to the foundation that it fell in from the least to the greatest. And I have taken um, a science, um, I've taken this approach in a surreal approach and um, as a science experiment um, theme to convey the conductive evaluation of the parable. Um, to decipher the work from the top, if you could go to the if you can go to the next, yes. Um, the, the beginning of the, the seed is depicted as the scripture itself, which is the Holy Bible. Um, in various parts of the New Testament, Jesus has been identified as the word of God. John 1 verse 1 to 5 um, declares that, as well as Jesus saying that he is known as the yoke, and that we should take um, his word upon him ourselves, which is um, said in Matthew 11, verse 29. The beanstalk like structure um, that floats mid air makes up the figure of the giant specimen that primarily um, counts as the life source of the seed, which is Christ. The word of God is aimed to make contact with what we now come to the four test tubes on the ground, which is on the next slide. <laughs> um, the four test tubes are, are occupied with hearts, uh, which connote the, um, the, fun, the, um, the decoding of the parable, which is um, written from verses 19 to 23 of Matthew 13. So starting from the left, the first um, test tube has a heart that depicts um, the heart, the heart that is hard, which means, which refers to one who receives the kingdom of God, the gospel, but does not accept it. And this is illustrated as the heart that has been tortured by birds. The second um, test tube is um, depicts of a heart that is um, shallow, and this um, depicts of one who receives the kingdom of God, and rejoices over the news, but is short-lived due to persecution. And this is illustrated um, by the scorching of the sun. So the heart is like melting. Um, the third um, one represents those whose heart is crowded with, um, by things of the world. So they do not focus on the thing, on what is um, true, which is the word of God. And this is depicted with um, thorns. And the last um, heart is represents the fruitful heart, which represents those who discovers the kingdom in reverence and understanding the word of God and and, and goes about it according to his, his will. 
um, those are the ones that bear good fruit. Um, the aim of this work is to bring us to reflect on how we are handling the message of salvation, the gift of life. We should always question whether we understand it and believe it. In regards to the reconciliation of God, the love and mysteries of the Father are being um, revealed through Christ to, to those who accept him into their lives, allowing the all-loving God to transform them and use them to bring others to that same place to reconcile with him too. And as for those who are affirmed believers in Christ, it is vital that we strive to be profound witnesses of the gospel in all we are and do. We should have the desire to continue the ministry that God, that Christ has left for us. And knowing that when we spread the gospel to someone that a seed is planted in them and eventually will germinate. We being vessels of God, um, um, we are known to be ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven, for it is God who plants the seed through us and that the Holy Spirit that gives us increase. We can find this in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 to 7. And that's it. Lovely. Thank you, Winifred. Um, let's, um, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go back to the, uh, if I can get my thing to work. I'm just going to go back to the um, first slide. So we've got the um, the whole uh, uh, work visible for us. Um, and uh, yeah, let me turn to Sarah and, and Mary and Jacqueline and see what's an observation or question you might want to bring from what you've heard from Winifred. Yeah, Jacqueline. Hi, Winifred. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I think I was really fascinated um, that you have represented, as you said, Christ as a beanstalk and, and how you've made that sort of nature natural. I, I'm fascinated by that. Could you tell me a little bit more why you've chosen that uh, motif? So, as I said before, um, according to the parable, um, this, uh, Jesus Christ began um, speaking of a farmer who planted, who went out to plant seed on the field. That seed is Jesus Christ himself. He is identified as the word of God, as this, as um, described in John 1 to 5. For, yeah, John chapter 1, verse 1 to 5. So the, I don't know if you could see it. Um, if you could go to the next slide, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. The, yes. the, uh, just see if I can, there we go. Yes. So I don't know, it's not really clear, but what I've illustrated um, around the flower part of the beanstalk is the scriptures. It's just the abbreviations of the scriptures. So that is the depiction of Jesus Christ. He is the whole word and he is the yoke that we should take upon ourselves and learn of him. So, yeah. And um, the beanstalk, like the stem, is just like the specimen. As I've said, I've taken a science experiment approach to it. So, yeah. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Um, Mary, yes. Oh, uh, well, and then Sarah. Um, Winifred, I thank you very much. It was so interesting hearing you describe your, your work. I, I was just wondering um, about the context in which um, people may have engaged with this. Um, so has it been exhibited or have, have your images been used, I don't know, for people going on retreat or um, undertaking meditations? Because I'm just so interested to hear where they've been used and, and how people have engaged with them. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't really exhibited any of my work, also this one. So, um, but what I hope to, um, what I hope for people to get from it, once I do exhibit it, is to reflect on where, on how they are receiving the word of God, if they have ever received, and just to have, um, just to be encouraged to, you know, hear the gospel for themselves and allow God to work in them. So that's thank all. you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Sarah. Well, thank you very much for, for that amazing explanation. And I was wondering whether you, you could uh, explain anything further about your choice of using test tubes as the symbolism. <laughs> was that because you, you see uh, sort of a link between new birth and reconciliation or what was your particular take? So on? this is quite off topic, but um, I was actually inspired by a, an artist, I can't remember his name, but he's a digital artist and his work is more or less 
on futuristic um, dystopian vibes of the world. So it was just simply just an inspiration from an other, another artist. Um, but in terms of the reconciliation of God, um, the idea is to is is for people to know that um, the word of God has effect on whoever listens to it, and that effect could could come and could germinate in any shape or form, con providing we allow um, God to work in us. So, yeah. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. And so for me, Winifred, the thing I think was striking here was that that reminder that yes, for our 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 reconciliation with God, there's different ways we can receive that word, um, and um, that for us to be fruitful soil, um, uh, that that there is an openness and a softness of heart that is needed uh, to see that that reconciliation come about. So that was one of the things yes. I really really enjoyed in what you shared. Thank you so much. Well, let's um, let's now move on to our third work. Um, this is a, a little bit of a change of tack. This is one that uh, work that is uh, first shown in in Salisbury Cathedral uh, called Les Colombes, uh, which is French for the doves. Um, and Jacqueline, this is a piece that you created. So, uh, what would you like to tell us about this? Oh, thank you, Alistair. So yes, this is an installation called Le Colomb by multimedia artist Michael Pendry. And in April 2017, Salisbury was deeply struck by the repercussions of the Novichok incident in the city with the poisoning of the script holes. It was um, sort of parts of Salisbury were completely closed for months and people were afraid to come into the city. So on social media uh, news, we viewed images of police enormous army presence, as well as men in hazmat suits with masks cleaning parts of our city. So needless to say, there was much fear and confusion. Uh, two months later, the cathedral hosted the Le Colombe exhibition, which carried a message of peace and reconciliation and offered people a shared space of sanctuary. The exhibition offered a path, I'd guess, back to peace, stability and trust. So this spectacular installation, which you can see in front of you, comprised of over 2,500 white origami doves, which were suspended as a flowing white river set at triforium level along the whole length of the nave. The white dove has inspired mankind with its innocence and purity. It is a physical and emotional message of peace. And within the context of the cathedral, it is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So Michael's flock actually originated in his hometown of Munich, Germany, and then it visited Mount Zion in Jerusalem before coming to Salisbury. Um, and it later moved to Grace Cathedral, San Francisco and the National Cathedral in Washington. So the flock grows with each exhibition and Michael has special doves, which he likes to include from previous venues. And these all have very personal stories. So when you entered the cathedral and you looked up, you were immediately engulfed in a magnificently beautiful vision. It was so, it was a really uplifting experience and it helped us to all feel optimistic. The flock flew in a gentle arc from the west doors where they were set high up. And then gradually as the installation moved towards the east end of the cathedral, the flock dropped in height so that people could almost touch them, creating an immersive environment when you looked up. The congregation and wider community were invited to participate in adding to the installation by creating their own doves. It was a very emotional experience to assist thousands of people who came together to fold their own white paper doves and to write prayers and messages of hope and peace inside them before they joined the hanging flock. This, this is a picture of, of when we opened the doors at night, but at night the cathedral opened the west doors so the people passing by could come in and enjoy this extraordinary atmosphere. Visitors sat for hours watching the gentle blue light playing and transforming the space. And this was accompanied by a soothing soundscape. Many people from the city who are not part of the cathedral community came to light candles and to sit together in reflection and contemplation. It was a physical, sensual and emotional experience. But the most extraordinary result was that the installation stretched beyond the walls of Salisbury Cathedral and embraced a stunned city. 
the impact of this exhibition on the city was simply outstanding. White paper doves were exhibited in every shop window in Salisbury and surrounding area. Schools, shops, businesses, and even Earlstoke prisoners participated. 25,000 sheets of origami paper, 15,000 instruction sheets, and 10,000 card templates were distributed for dove making workshops. Now, I originally commissioned this installation on behalf of Salisbury Cathedral to mark the centenary of the end of World War I. And the exhibition was intended as a reminder that the need for peace and reconciliation remains as powerful today as it was in 1918. And the exhibition was a powerful demonstration of the unifying and uplifting effect of a sensitively chosen installation in the setting of a sacred space. Thank you, Jacqueline. So uh, reflections, observations, or, or questions from Mary, Sarah, and Winifred? Um, an observation first, I'm really interested in how um, the kind of the, the events that struck Salisbury kind of reinterpreted the art. It's a sort of a, an analogous thing to what we were saying about how Coventry Cathedral reinterpreted Epstein's sculpture. Um, and I, I found it so compelling about, you know, you were saying there were doves in every window and all the people who participated, that, that's really moving. I was just wondering um, if you could say anything about um, whether Salisbury Cathedral did acts of worship, sort of specifically um, engaging with, with the installation and, and how, that, how that felt, Jacqueline. Uh, yes, in the evenings when the, when the doors were open, um, we did have, um, I think, Canon Robert Titley um, and one or two other um, members of the clergy were there for people to, as I say, people came to light candles um, and, and just spoke to people. And yes, there were, um, I, normally we have lectures when we have an exhibition, but I think we did have uh, ref periods of reflection and, um, and prayers, obviously, uh, for the city of Salisbury. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, go on, Sarah. Um, Jacqueline, I was just wondering, when this art installation was taken down, um, did you and those who are there at the cathedral experience a sense of loss that is coming down? It's funny you should say that, sorry, because um, we do experience that quite regularly, but more so, yes, with this installation. It really uh, seemed to have been a focal point for the people of the city of Salisbury. Um, and actually, we did keep it up for longer than anticipated. Um, but as with the Epstein, you know, you can't keep them, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, and it was wonderful to know that that the the prayers and um, reflections that pe people wrote on their doves would then fly on to other locations. And that was quite a lovely connection to know that they had a life beyond Salisbury. Mm. Yeah, Winfred. Um, I would just like to say how I I really like how you involved the public to participate in something that may not coin, like, coincide with them in terms of faith, but for the fact that they could, I mean, like enjoy an activity that involves spirituality in terms of the space and the work. And for example, you made them to write prayers, or they could know if, you know, their praise may have been answered, you know, just by the fact that it could come to a space and, you know, feel feel um, comfortable to, you know, express and reconcile with a God that, you know, that they may believe eventually, but, you know, just the act of gathering and, and that's, yeah, that's basically it. That's what I really like about their work, just the assembly of the people outside of the church, yeah. Mm -hmm. We find that, that art does engage with people outside the mm. formal structures of faith, belief and belonging, but then they become, mm. they do belong by that mm. Mm. Um, participation. Mm. I, I think for me, Jacqueline, the thing that was is most striking about this is how timing can be such a critical thing, because obviously you, you had planned this, as you said, to be something to mark um, 100 years since the end of the, of the First World War. Um, but the events in Salisbury 
completely transformed the significance of, of, of this work and the significance for the wider community, not just for uh, not just for people in the church. And that that yes, that that you know, I guess that's where I would sense something of the spirit at work. Divine intervention um, is the only thing I can say to that. <laughs> Um, and obviously the, the, the dove as a symbol of the spirit is very appropriate with that as well. Um, that's, that's lovely. Thank you so much for all you've shared there. Well, the image of birds in flight, uh, I think takes us neatly into our next work, which is an assembly of origami cranes. And so let me just see if I can uh, get this to that. Um, oh, here's one more of, of this with um, uh, some visitors viewing uh, viewing Les Colombes in Salisbury Cathedral. Um, but so uh, here we've got an assembly of origami cranes. And Sarah, you were involved in developing this quite recently for St Mary's Church in Banbury. Uh, tell us the story of the origami cranes and uh, why you developed this collection at St Mary's as part of the arts festival you organised. Yes, thank you. Um, so we have just come to the end of an arts festival which lasted from early April this year through until uh, the weekend just, just gone uh, around the finishing on the 23rd of October. Uh, actually, I must just bring in my, my question to Jacqueline about whether or not there was a feeling of loss when the um, doves came down. It's because our origami cranes came down eight days ago, Monday of last week. And I can honestly say was a very deep sense of loss um, as the art installation came down. Um, perhaps the, the nearest equivalent I could give would be to say it's a bit like when you take your Christmas decorations down. Uh, and not only because there's a huge empty space where we had the most amazing art installation, but the, the knowledge that, it, that so much work was involved in putting it up. And then in really a matter of an hour or so, what took two and a half weeks of installing up let alone the time it took to make the cranes, um, you know, that, that comes to an end in such a short time. But I am, of course, beginning at the end of the story, which probably isn't a very good place to start. So let me go back now to the beginning. Um, <clears throat> we agreed at St Mary's that we would have a festival to celebrate 200 years since St Mary's Church had been rebuilt in the amazing style, which you can just catch a little bit of in the background of this picture. Uh, it's not a, a standard cruciform shaped church. It's very much uh, a square build. It was built um, in the, it was rebuilt, I should say, um, during the late 1790s and finished in October, by October 1822. Um, so we decided we'd have a festival to celebrate all, all, the, all the wonderful rebuilding. And amongst many other events, we decided to have this art origami crane art installation put up. The lady who devised it is called Karen Baldry, and uh, she was uh, her, she worked um, for Banbury Business and Arts, uh, and she masterminded this particular project. It was a very very long time in the planning, and um, it went up uh, during the first couple of weeks of July. And originally was only going to be up for three weeks um, to go middle of July through to uh, middle of August, actually to coincide with the Commonwealth Games. It was such a beautiful installation and so much work was involved in putting it up that actually we decided we would keep it up right through to the end of the festival, which is why it actually stayed up until late October. In terms of the actual uh, construction of the cranes, uh, this in itself was a method of reaching out into the community. Uh, we organized in St. Mary's Church itself back in March on Wednesday mornings. Uh, I run a session called Creating Space, where people come in and they bring their hobbies with them and um, they can come and have a cup of tea or coffee and a chat. It's an opportunity just to engage with other people in a, a drop-in way. But specifically in March, we had four Wednesday mornings where we invited people to come and make these origami cranes. I have to say they were not entirely easy to construct, um, but we had a number of people who, who very quickly became really expert at doing it. And so we made uh, a fair number of cranes on those Wednesdays in March. 
We also had a uh, we had a session where we invited girl guides to come in in early April, and they made cranes. Um, there were other community groups in Banbury who had sessions run by Karen to make cranes, um, and the, the total number which were made were not short of not far short of three thousand. Um, so you know, the, the actual community element to this was wonderful for uh, enabling people to create something which was then going to go up in a big public space and really um, the scale of it was, was quite remarkable. You can only see part of the installation here. Um, it basically ran above the central aisle of the church uh, and then at the west end, the, the, um, the, the threads, if I can call that, the, the, on which the cranes were mounted, uh, then came down diagonally down to the font. And actually the cranes which led into the font, quite literally into the um, front edge of the font, were white ones, um, which seemed particularly uh, appropriate that they were white. But in fact, the colored ones were, in many cases, the colors were done by particular groups and organizations in Banbury. So when people came along through the summer to have a look at this, uh, those who knew what colour cranes they had made were able to spot them uh, mm -hmm. uh, above their heads. Now, the, the, the idea behind origami cranes in itself is actually a reconciliation story. And this was a, a story which I was able to go into our church primary school uh, back on Armistice Day, November last year, and to talk to them about the symbolism of cranes, origami cranes. They are very much a symbol of peace and of flourishing and of, um, of reconciliation. And the, the sort of the story behind them is that uh, they, they originate really from Japan. Um, the origami crane became a symbol of peace in Japan at the end of the Second World War because of a young girl called Sadako Sasaki. Uh, when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima on August the 6th in 1945, this little girl, Sadako, was only two at the time. And she was exposed to radiation. Um, and 10 years later, when she was 12, she was diagnosed with leukemia. And she uh, had to go into hospital because she was very seriously ill. And while she was there, one of her friends, called Chizuko, came to visit her bringing origami, um, origami folding paper. And she told her friend Sadako about the legend that in Japan, a sacred bird, which is the crane, lives for 100 years. And if a sick person folds 1,000 paper cranes, then the belief is, was, that that person would get better. So, this little 12 year old girl, Sadako, made folded paper cranes in the hope that she would make a full recovery. Sadly, she didn't get better. Um, but in the year that she was making them, she did make over 1,000 cranes. She died in 1955. And she sent, while she was still alive, she gave these cranes to her friends. And after she died, her friends continued to make cranes and actually to send them across the world to other people as well. And in fact, there is now in the Peace Park in Hiroshima, um, there is a statue of Sadako with her arms outstretched, holding up, um, holding up a crane behind her. And it's very much the case that, that origami cranes you know, do now symbolize uh, peace and flourishing and reconciliation. And of course, when we intended, uh, when we planned to put this art installation up, uh, which would have been well over a year and a half ago, there was no anticipation then of the situation arising in Ukraine. Uh, and it has been perhaps particularly, um, a particularly sort of appropriate uh, backgrounds to this, that, that we have had so many prayers for peace and, and the ongoing need for peace and reconciliation, which these cranes do come to symbolise. Lovely, thank you, Sarah. Um, a reflection or observation or question from uh, Winifred or Mary or Jacqueline. 
just to say that it's a very moving story and thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, one other thing actually I might just add is that while this has been up uh, in, in St Mary's Church, it has brought so many visitors in to see it through the summer months. Mm. And we also did a sound and light uh, display with it, which took place uh, on two different occasions. Uh, and it really was just so powerful to see how these, these origami cranes catch the light and particularly when we had the special lighting on it, it you know it was just I say a magical experience it really was almost otherworldly to look at it and I think one of the things that I'm struck by Sarah is again you know with some similarities with the um Les Colombes in in, in Salt Cathedral how you involved so many different people in the community in helping to create this um, and your vision for the arts festival being something that brings people together. This is kind of, you know, very much symbolizes that actually bringing people together and bringing people together because they long to see peace in our world. Absolutely. And I think also that, uh, you know, people of, of faith, people of no faith have come into St. Mary's, you know, to see many of the things, to experience. I'm going to talk a little bit later on about one of the other events we had in the festival. Uh, and I, I do think it's been one of the um, one of the successes about the festival is that probably over 90 percent of the people who've come in to attend any event, whether it's been musical or uh, to see this art installation. We've had other installations up as well, um, that the, most of those people who've come in are not regular members of the uh, congregation in St. Mary's. And in fact, in many instances, I think they're people who haven't necessarily been in the church at all before or at least not for a very long time. That's fabulous, lovely. Thank you so much, Sarah. Well, I think um, that's um, a good point just for us to sort of mark our sort of, oh, well, actually just over half, we've gone a bit over halfway. But what I want to suggest is that we take a very brief moment to stand and stretch just so everybody can get their sort of circulation going and, and see us through to the end. So I will have that for us. So don't, don't disappear, but do feel free to stand and, uh, Roll your shoulders about and uh, just make sure your um, uh, your circulation is is uh, is staying uh, staying vi vibrant. Okay, well we've had a chance to hear um, from each of our speakers with uh, one work that um, uh, they wanted to reflect on. Um, uh, for those of you who are, who, who are joining us on the call, if, if you've got questions, observations or own that you'd like to make, then please do contribute these into the chat and chat. And, and as we get towards the end, we'll see if we can find a way uh, to enable our speakers to respond to those as well as to the things they've been uh, asking one another or observing for one another. Well, let's now move out of uh, the church context into a work of art that was, was produced within the a community. And this one is a reminder for me, at least, that God's Holy Spirit is at work in the whole world and is very far from restricted uh, to the church. So let me uh, move us on to this. This is a work that is called See the Bigger Picture. Uh, and Mary is going to, to tell us about it. So, uh, yeah, thank you. So um, I. The first image I chose focused on uh, questions of reconciliation primarily to God or to ourselves. Um, but this work that I want to share with you um, focuses on what it is to be reconciled to other people. And as Alistair says, it's called See the Bigger Picture. And um, I love this photograph in particular because actually the mural is painted onto the side of uh, Coventry Central Police Station, which is just five minutes walk from Coventry Cathedral. Um, and it was painted in the spring of 2022 by a graffiti artist called Wazerski. Um, and he took his brief, um, and I think this is really exciting, from um, conversations that took place between West Midlands Police and Coventry's homeless community. And there are two, uh, two groups of people who often have conflicting needs or aims. So the police um, are keen for, for good reasons to need to move people on and the homeless people need their safe place to, to sleep and to be. And so as part of um, Coventry UK City of Culture, 
uh, West Midlands Police did, did a bid for some of the cultural funding. And this was one of their projects that they gathered together police officers and people with lived experience of homelessness. And together they had conversations about how each experienced the other. And then the homeless community shared with the police um, their, their hopes, their desires, their dreams for what life might be like and the nurture that they would need from others in order to make this possible. And the nurture is expressed particularly in the hand with the watering can. And I particularly like that it is as if the hand is reaching out from the police station to, to water these spring flowers, which express the hopes of people who find that they don't have a permanent place to stay. It's a nice little side anecdote to say that the project was partly funded by City of Culture, but also by the proceeds of crime, which the Police and Crime Commissioner confiscated and gave to the project, which I really like. And it also forms part of um, Coventry's wider um, mural graffiti project called In Paint We Trust, which I think is quite good. Um, and uh, Julie Harrison, who is, who is a sergeant who led on this project for West Midlands Police, um, spoke about how this project had given the police an opportunity to have conversations with people that they wouldn't normally speak to. And there, I think, captured is how this piece of art and the, the kind of the co-creation of it enabled really important conversations to take place. Another thing that the police did was have graffiti workshops for young people kind of teetering on the edge of criminality. And that was another really creative response, I think, to the city of culture. So that's a bit of the, the background of this mural, but I wanted to suggest two or three ways in which this sort of art can contribute to reconciliation. And, and the first of those is that I think there's a really important role in reconciliation for co-creation because co-creating a work of art demands really careful listening. If you're gonna capture in a work of art somebody's story or experience, you have to listen really carefully. And in reconciliation, paying attention to somebody else's story is absolutely fundamental. Uh, there's a theologian called Stanley Hauervas that many of you will have heard of. And he says that reconciliation really happens when our enemy tells our story in such a way as we say, oh yes, that is my story. And a young woman called Haley uh, was one of the homeless community who participated in this project. And her testimony is, she said, I've been homeless three times for three separate occasions, for three separate reasons. And now I'm sitting in a room and my opinions are being listened to by the police. It's such a powerful thing for her. You know, she hasn't felt listened to, but here the police were listening to her story. And then here is her story in some way reimagined on the side of the police station. And that's the second way I think in which a piece of art like this contributes to reconciliation. And that's giving hospitality to another person's experience. For me, it's really significant that this mural has ended up on the wall of the police station, because not only have the police listened to the experience of the homeless community, but they now hold it. They kind of own it in some ways. And I think that's a real challenge when we think about the arts and reconciliation, how we, we really give hospitality to the experience of, of another. And it's something we're thinking about at Coventry Cathedral as we seek to diversify our programme and attract more diverse audiences. We're having to think about how um, their stories can be expressed in our programming, as well as in inviting them to be an audience. Now, how are, the, how are their stories reflected? In, in what we offer at the cathedral and how do we hold other people's stories. And the third thing which Alistair touched on, I'm being dazzled now, um, in his introduction to this piece is that this is a really a powerful challenge to the church, I think, um, to, to realise that God's reconciling work is not just limited to the precincts of places that we choose to designate as holy, but that God is at work in the world around us without our initiative and without our control or input. Um, a foundational text for us at Coventry Cathedral about reconciliation is from 2 Corinthians, where Paul says that 
uh, God has already been working in to reconcile us to himself and that he's inviting us to join in that work of reconciliation. And so um, as the kind of the new canon for arts and reconciliation, I drive past this every day on my way to and from work. And it's a call to humility for me that um, I'm not the person who holds all the expertise and I'm not the person who holds the space for this um, solely that um, in our city, uh, you know, God is at work um, in projects such as this one. So um, it's really precious to me, this mural. It arrived as I was arriving and I, I love its hopefulness. And now I'm gonna shut my blind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Uh, well, let's see whether there's uh, an observation or a uh, question or, uh, or reflection. Yes, yeah, Sarah. Um, what Mary has just been saying absolutely resonates with me because in my role as chaplain for the arts, I do feel it's very much about encouraging other people to discover their own creativity. I believe that creativity is a God-given thing, um, but and that we all of us have creativity within us, but we perhaps sometimes need opportunities or encouragement to develop it. And I think the idea of going out into the community and uh, encouraging other people to, to bring their own creativity along to whatever forum it may be, and it may not necessarily be in a holy space, it may be in a holy space, um, I think that's just such a wonderful uh, opportunity that, that we are given to do. And Mary, I really identify with what you were just talking about. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, Winifred. Um, I just like to elaborate on what you have mentioned concerning um, challenging the church on, you know, spreading the gospel. Um, I feel like it's 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 okay for us to kind of like remember that the commission of Christ isn't limited to the four walls of the church, but it's, it's, its agenda is to spread the good news and peace and love and compassion to the four corners of the earth. So that is just not limited to the church, is it? It's, you know, going through communities as you have mentioned in your work and, it's really nice to see how you have um, managed to do that with your community. So, yeah. And, and I think it's a both hand being absolutely, uh, you know, the cathedral is here to um, share the hope that we have um, mm. in Christ, absolutely. But I, I, I just think it's exciting that, um, um, I'm sure Alistair would use the phrase, the life of the spirit um, it, it is, beyond, is beyond our walls and, you know, the spirit blows where she will. And, mm. You know, for me, this was just such a heartening, heartening example of that, um, and a real sense through the city of culture that we were sharing in this together. Um, yeah. Now, Mary, one of the things I was wondering is I don't know whether you had any conversation with any of the any of the police officers because I'm wondering what the impact for them is of having this mural on the side of the police station. My my kind of expectation is that you know, as they're coming to work and coming. <laughs> coming to the police station, this, this would kind of change how they think about what they're doing. But I, I don't know whether you had any conversation or, or had not any opportunity to hear any of that. I, I did, and, and there's a couple of moments that stand out for me from towards the end of the City of Culture. One was that the another project that the police did was to hold um, a concert in Coventry Cathedral with, with the UK um, Police Symphony Orchestra, who were fantastic, but also they drew in community groups from Coventry. Um, so there's a fantastic Irish dance troupe, which I particularly enjoyed, and um, some Bangra dancers and so on. But the, but the interesting thing about that was that the police had drawn in um, hard to reach in terms of cultural events audience. So there were audiences from across the city with whom they'd really engaged. And um, the police inspector who led on it, Helen, I can't remember her surname, I'm afraid, she was, she was tremendously moved by the fact that they had managed through the arts to engage with these hard to reach communities. And it was one of the most diverse audiences I've ever seen in the cathedral in, in my short time here. And then the other picture was that we had a parade at the end of the city of culture called This Is The City, where lots of different community groups went in this parade. Um, Catherine and John and I from the cathedral were all in our robes in the faith section. But as we walked past the police station, Helen and her colleagues were on the balconies of the police station 
waving to us. And they were clearly really proud of, of their contribution to the city of culture. And they were there to kind of almost sort of show it off and, and say, you know, here we are. Um, so it was significant for them in terms of the opportunities to build relationship. And that's particularly what I heard from them, that this was a, an amazing vehicle for making connections where they sometimes struggle. That's just a, a, just a really lovely story, Mary. Thank you. Well, one of the striking things for me about See the Bigger Picture mural is it's a way of giving voice to the voices of a group whom we rarely listen to um, and who rarely have a public platform to express themselves, as, as, as Mary's described in terms of hearing from the homeless community in Coventry. Our next co collection of work is drawn from another group in our society whose voices rarely get heard, those people who are incarcerated in prison. And Jacqueline was involved in a project working with a group of prisoners from Earl Stoke Prison in Wiltshire. So Jacqueline, tell us about this work uh, called Alternative Perspectives, I think. And let me just see if I can get the slideshow to table and move on to there we go. There's there's uh, part of it. Thanks, um, yeah, uh, so, tell us a, a bit about this and about uh, the connection with reconciliation that you're seeing, Jacqueline. Thank, thank you, Alistair. And if you'd be kind enough to, uh, to also show the other picture a little bit later, but I'll leave that to you. Um, so 2015 marked the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta and Salisbury Cathedral has one of the best preserved original documents of which there are only four remaining. So to celebrate this special anniversary, a selection of art exhibitions and community projects were organized with the objective of highlighting the values, the meaning and the legacy of Magna Carta. Um, to fulfill the community ambition, we needed to find a partner to collaborate with on a practical project, which we wanted to then show in the cathedral. So working alongside my colleagues, then Canon Treasurer Sarah Mullally and Education and Outreach Director Sarah Rickett, accompanied by six volunteers, I led a series of workshops at Earl Stoke Prison. Our partners were, of course, the 30 offenders who participated, the prison education department and friends of Earl Stoke Prison who helped to fund the project. And the project was called Alternative Perspectives because we're looking to explore the offenders' points of view on the themes of justice, rights, law and power while they're incarcerated and had their freedom and rights curtailed for a period of time. So on a preliminary visit to Ulstoke, we saw that the prison had good art facilities. It had a selection of studios and a working kiln. So the project could explore the ideas of Magna Carta through the creation of encaustic tiles, which are terracotta tiles combined with black and white slip in a process inspired by the original medieval encaustic tiles found at the cathedral. This enterprise was intended to provide the offenders the means to explore ideas of justice, the role of justice in society and the role of the individuals as part of a wide society and sort of balancing the needs of the individual with the needs of society and including through the rule of law and a better understanding of the ideas actually of Magna Carta. The program was launched with an open discussion at Earl Stoke, introducing the offenders to the objectives and the principles of Magna Carta and the potential to convey these through some artistic expression. Um, this included a PowerPoint presentation to show them what the document looked like and images of previous art exhibitions at Salisbury Cathedral. So two further sessions took place to explore the participants' creativity individually and as a group, with practical elements, including initial ideas drawn or written down. In these creative workshops, we would share words like family, power, right and wrong, and the offenders were then given three minutes to respond and to draw what those words meant to them. This was really fascinating. For example, the word power produced pictures of pound signs, guns, knives, a crown and a fist. And the word right produced images of family, the cross, a light bulb and a Bible. Over a period of eight weeks, we assisted and supported each individual independently, mentoring them to allow them to consider what they would like to create and to help coordinate their ideas from inception to delivery, culminating with a firing in the kiln. I have to point out that we were overwhelmed by the offender's diligence and creativity throughout this process. 
A final session at the prison was to jointly discuss how the collaboration had worked with input from all parties and concluded with contributions on how the exhibition was to be curated and the installation process. The participants were requested to write a summary of the project and the process as they understood it, expressing their own thoughts of the project. The findings suggested that they had learned about more about Magna Carta, they had learned new skills, they responded through creativity and developed their own ideas, they gained focus, self-esteem and confidence, and they had indicated positive steps towards rehabilitation. Well, weeks later, we enjoyed a very well attended opening of the Alternative Perspective exhibition, where visitors could view not only the two large montage panels of tiles, but more importantly, the opportunity to see the offenders' drawings and writings, which were displayed in a large glass case alongside the panels. But the very best part of this project was after the exhibition had finished at Salisbury, we installed the panels in the visitor room at Earlstoke Prison and shared with the participants the comments from the public, which were written in a book beside the exhibition. The offenders were so proud of the work that they had created and were overwhelmed by the observations and comments written by the public in the book of comments. Many of the men felt that although they were imprisoned behind walls, what they thought and created could be seen by people outside. They were heard, and what they had achieved had been recognized. Elizabeth Williams, the learning and skill manager of HMR, HMP Earlstoke said, this isn't just an art project, its implications are far broader. The art sessions functioned as a forum in which we managed to get the prisoners to really think about issues such as human rights and wrongs and the justice system. The feedback we have received has been powerful it's been a learning experience for them and for us. Wow, fabulous, Jacqueline. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that story. Uh, let's hear some, uh, yeah, a, a brief observational question from, from maybe one or two of our other speakers. I'm just wondering a bit about, um, I mean, it's really interesting because I used to work in, in the prison service, so it, it sounds such a brilliant project. I'm, I'm, you know, it's really exciting to me. And I'm, I'm just wondering um, whether there's any longer term um, research into the impact of the project on the prisoners um, in terms of, of, of reconciliation themes or rehabilitation themes. I wonder whether that's something that the prison um, have been able to follow up to see a longer term impact of this project. Well, I'm not, I can't um, tell you more than the fact that there became a relationship between Salisbury Cathedral and Earlstoke Prison. And this was just the beginning of very many different projects that, um, that the cathedral and Earlstoke Prison did together. Um, so I guess it was a portal through which those, that reconciliation could actually take place. Um, it, it, it was an incredibly rewarding uh, project for myself and the people who participated as well. Mm. Because my, my experience of prisons is that they they often haven't had ways of, of being invited to express themselves in creative ways and that then expression in more destructive ways can be the consequence of that. So I, I think it'd be really interesting for these and similar projects to be monitored over a longer term. It's, it's really fascinating. Thanks. Um, Winifred, you had, you had uh, an observational question. Yes. Um, I just wanted to know what was the most impactful part of this whole um, thing for you personally? Like what impacted you personally? Well, obviously I've never been into a prison before, so um, mm -hmm. and I had to go through a whole series. I, I was a key holder, so it was it was um, quite um, well. I was I was quite frightened when I went in for the very first time, but <laughs> meeting these people, to be honest, meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, the offenders and discussing the project with them, but finally assisting them to create something really remarkable was very rewarding for me. Um, and mm. as I said, taking it back to them and, and showing them that actually people had heard them and that what they had created had been appreciated uh, was mm. also very rewarding for me. That's good. 
I'm one of the things I'm struck by, Jacqueline, is 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 Jesus at one point in his ministry talks about um, the importance of remembering those who are in prison. And it strikes me that what um, emerged out of this was the cathedral finding a way to continue to remember, to build a relationship with those who are in prison and mm. for them not to be forgotten, because I think it's very easy for us to want to forget those who are incarcerated. Um, and mm. uh, yeah, so that that for me feels like a, a significant piece and part of our greater reconciliation with all of the people in our society, including those who've you know who have offended in different ways in ways that have ended up uh, them leading to them being 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 put in prison. Um, so yeah, that's that was I think you know one of the things that's striking for me in this. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Well, um, I'm I'm noticing the time. Well, I'm just for those of you who are still on the call, we may run a little bit over because we do want to make sure we get to hear uh, our, about our last two pieces. Um, but so our next um, reflection links to the display of a Russian Orthodox icon at St Mary's Church in Banbury uh, as part of their big arts festival this year, um, and an associated icon workshop. And Sarah, you were again involved in curating this and, and faced some unexpected challenges early this year after the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the sadly ongoing war there. Tell, tell us something of the story. Thank you, Alistair. Yes, well, when I put together the programme for the festival, that was back in the summer of 2021, um, and one of the uh, linked weekends, which I put together a plan for, was in early May, where we were going to have an icons themed uh, weekend. And on the Friday evening, we arranged for Father Stephen, who is the priest of St. Nicholas, the Wonder Worker Church in North Oxford, which um, is a Russian Orthodox church. We arranged that he would come along with his choir uh, to talk about icons, including this icon that you can see in the picture here in front of you. Uh, we also, over the weekend, we had an art workshop where people were able to come and paint their own icons. Um, and then we concluded the, the few days with a quiet day, which was led um, using the, the icon that you can see in front of you, which is uh, Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And um, so all, all that was you know, well planned, well in advance. And um, I was very much looking forward to that weekend. Um, then when February this year uh, came and Russia you, in, invaded Ukraine, I could see that there was potentially going to be a difficulty um, about the Friday evening event um, because I had invited Father Stephen from a Russian Orthodox Church. Um, so I took the precaution of speaking to our area bishop, um, Bishop Gavin, I talked to our festival patron, and I talked to the incumbent at St. Mary's. Uh, all of us were you know, discussing whether or not we could go ahead with the Friday evening event. And we actually felt that it was really quite important that we did proceed with, with this event. Um, I, had, I had some email correspondence with Father Stephen, uh, in which he was very clear that, that he and his church completely um, uh, completely uh, were, were not in, were very deeply disturbed by the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, Father Stephen has people in his congregation who either themselves come from Ukraine or who have um, Ukrainian relatives. They have raised a large amount of money for, um, for churches in Kiev and Kharkiv. Um, and they also actually had a break in themselves about the time that I was emailing um, Father Stephen to ask what, you know, whether, we, whether or not we would go ahead with this event. So we decided that it really was important that we did continue to have um, this, this Nicholas the Wonder Worker come to St Mary's on the Friday evening. I will confess one practical thing on all the... Um, all the publicity which was done shortly before the event, I did actually remove the word Russian from the publicity. So it did actually say Orthodox Church. Yes, thank you. You can see there on the right. 
uh, that I, uh, so it's an icons theme, but it's orthodox, um, it just, it says orthodox speaker and orthodox church. Of course, the actual um, use of icons is, is widely spread amongst uh, various different orthodox churches anyway. Um, so it, it, but it did seem appropriate out of consideration for events, perhaps just to remove that word Russian from the publicity. Um, I had a number of people in our own congregation who sent me emails or made contact with me and said, was I uh, going to go ahead with this event? And I did feel actually it was quite important that we did go ahead with it. Um, I mean, it seems to me that if we were going to say, well, um, we don't want to have a Russian Orthodox church coming and taking part in our festival, we hardly would uh, be fulfilling our role as an inclusive church if we are excluding another group of Christians on the grounds of their ethnic origins of their church affiliation. And to be quite honest, if one took this uh, argument to its extreme, then would we start forbidding having music performed in the festival by Tchaikovsky or Borodin uh, on the grounds that they were Russian composers? So all in all, after a lot of prayer and thought, and it did actually feel very much to me that it was a risk-taking thing to do, we went ahead with the Friday evening. Uh, we put up a U Ukrainian flag around one of the pillars on the outside of the church. You might just have noticed on the picture, which was just uh, up a minute or two ago, you can see the, the Ukrainian flag there very clearly outside the west end of the church. Uh, Alistair, I don't know if you can just move a picture on again. To, can you see we put a flag up there? And I specifically asked Father Stephen if uh, he would include prayers within the Friday evening event. It wasn't a, a service. It wasn't a concert. It was a kind of hybrid of the two. So I called it basically an orthodox event. And the, at the end of, of the evening, um, they included prayers, a, a sung litany of uh, liturgical chants from the Kievan, Kievan tradition. Um, so it was actually a very special Friday evening. Uh, I should say that one or two of the people who had emailed me during the week uh, expressing their reservations, when I made further contact back with them, and I was very respectful of the fact that, that perhaps they didn't feel they could support this event, but I did include a, um, an excerpt from Father Stephen's email to several people just to show them what their, this church was, um, had, had already been doing towards, towards the situation, improving the situation for the churches in Ukraine. And it was the most wonderful Friday evening, and there were a number of people who had said in advance that they didn't think they were going to come. When they heard my explanations about um, in advance of the evening about why it was we were going ahead. Um, actually, some of these people did come and everybody agreed at the end of that Friday evening event. It was the most spiritually recharging um, occasion. We were most definitely better informed about the Orthodox Church generally. Uh, and I think it was a risk that was worth taking uh, and I think, you know, for reconciliation, always it's going to involve taking risks. This was one that we took. I was a little bit nervous in advance, but the Holy Spirit was most definitely moving in that place. And all those who came absolutely agreed that it was right to go ahead with it. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. I, I would like to make a connection here, although you haven't explicitly done this, with the story of the woman at the well, because you've got a Samaritan woman and a Jewish man. Um, and th there's a risk for both of them in, in being engaged in a conversation. Um, and Jesus obviously takes a significant risk in having a conversation with her and she, mm. she with him. Um, but, you know, a little bit like the Russians and Ukrainians, the Jews and Samaritans were sort of cousins. Um, uh, but there was a lot of tension between them. Uh, and so, um, you know, actually this, this uh, particular icon strikes me actually does connect with the story that you, you, you've you told. So um, yes. I, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that certainly is, is one of the things that struck me. Very much so, thank you. Yeah, Winifred, let's have an observational question from you and then we'll give you a chance to, to talk about your last piece. Yes, um, it's so fascinating to see how God works. I mean, as you have mentioned, Alistair, the 
correlation between the icon and the event that happened um, at the at the church it's just amazing and it just comes to show that um we as the body of christ we should really move with one mind one love and one accord what the enemy does to us humans i mean he hates us i know like the enemy really hates us and he does his best to put um god's most prized creation against itself so for the fact that you went through despite the challenges that had occurred it, it really shows that god was and is with you and and the enemy did not prevail so if anything to god be the glory so amen yeah, yeah. That, that is lovely thank you winifred well winifred why don't you continue and take us into reflecting on our last piece um which is entitled fix your eyes on jesus um, and uh, like Winifred's earlier work, this one is inspired by a reflection on a passage from the Bible, this time from some verses from uh, the letter to the Hebrews. So, uh, Winifred, tell us a bit about this piece and the connection that you're making with, with God's reconciling work. Okay, thank you. So, Fix Your Eyes on Jesus is another recreation of works made during my art degree. It is inspired by the scriptures, as you have said, Hebrews 12, 2 and I will read a scripture from the New King James. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and, set, and sat upon the right hand of the throne of God. I will be breaking down the scripture from, the, from sentence to sentence. And the first sentence of this scripture states, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Um, the use of the binoculars in which I've illustrated in this work is used as a model to illustrate how one is eager to look onto something with great focus. I use this as an icon to object the act of an observer, as its purpose is to help enhance what is visually far away. It can help us to watch closely, to pay attention, and to stay focused. It is encouraged to have Christ at the center of our interests for it is for he it is the one who for he is the one who narrates our lives and transforms our souls in perfect condition worthy for God our father it is Jesus that carries us through the journey of salvation shaping us in the likeness of holiness despite what life may throw at us it is the reason why it is written that Jesus is the finisher of our faith the agenda of Christ is to conquer and restore life and prosperity. This can be received provided we seek him. Therefore, the only thing that we need to do is to keep our eyes on him in and what he has done on the cross. Speaking of the cross, the pinnacle of the good news, the second part of verse two says, for who for, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What Christ did on the cross was the finishing work of salvation. He took upon himself the adapted price of sin and conquered death and everything that hinders us from having fellowship with God. It is because of this, Jesus Christ is counted as the one who granted the grace that God has given us in order to reunite with him and have life. Now that Christ has fulfilled what was necessary in victory, being the bridge between him and God, between man and God, he has obtained the joy of we are showing the opportunity for us to reconcile from internal separation to God. This is simply the description of the good news. Therefore, we should rejoice for the great kindness God has for you and me, his most prized possession. Moving on to the ending of the scripture, we see the reward of the work that Jesus completed, which is the will of the Father despising shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We must understand that the conflict of the Calvary was not easy to behold. Jesus, knowingly so, had to take upon himself all of the physical, mental and spiritual pain, the persecution, the abuse, the absence of love and the judgment of sin, which was rightfully meant for us. He had done this great thing knowing that if he was able to endure the complications of this very act, he'd be able to save mankind. 
And because Christ decided to honor God with his whole heart, not allowing himself to be bothered by the conflict attached to the cross, he has now been rewarded with great glory. We should remember that living for Christ is not easy in as much as it is profitable for our souls. We are bound to go through difficulties that can affect us physically and spiritually. Therefore, it is important to stay vigilant, knowing that the, that trouble may come our way and not to give into them. We should consider him looking onto the cross, the solution to our problems. Furthermore, I conclude that this work depicts Christ as the source, the ideal role model and the expectation of our eternal relationship with God. The cross is the means of the source that concretes our access to the Father. If we want all these things that the God our Father has blessed us with, which is internal life, peace, and more, then we must understand that the means of obtaining it is to observe the gift that he has given to us, which is Jesus Christ. Thank you. Can't hear you. Sorry, I I put myself on mute. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, yeah, uh, Mary, let's have a, an observation or or or, or question that uh, to draw us towards a close. I was just really interested in Winifred the sort of the artistic process for you, um, how it is for you when you're creating these works of art. Is it is it a kind of a prayer practice for you? Um, uh, yeah, I just thought whether you, whether you can say anything about that. Oh, you're, you're on, on mute, Winifred, so we need you back. Oh, sorry. There sorry. we go. Yeah, sorry, could you repeat your question? Yeah, I was just interested in, in the process for you of creating these really fascinating works and oh, whether, yeah. for, whether for you it's a kind of a spiritual practice, a prayer practice, as well as an artistic one, and how those two things dovetail for you. So um, it is a, this whole um, project that I've made in uni was a, uh, form of worship mm. um, between, you're just like a sense of fellowship with between me and God. Um, I decided to dedicate um, my final year to, you know, praising God and just glorifying God, firstly, for the gift that he has gifted me with, which is, you know, the, the gift of creativity to make art. And in the in hopes to evangelize with the artwork so yeah it's just a combination of worship and evangelism mm, thank yeah. you and Jacqueline now let's have a, a concluding observation or comment from you sorry I was just fascinated by the materials you use and I want to do some find out what sort of scale they were and fascinated by this use of the clouds that you use and whether those were words or whether they were just um parts that that you've sort of created um so what the is work it? yeah sorry um so the work is it's, it's made of coffee um fine liner acrylic pen and just the drawing tools um in terms of the the landscape of the work um the use of clouds was the idea of looking up because i mean we believe that heaven is upwards so it's just the idea of like looking up and using the binoculars. And also um, I love looking at clouds. Clouds is my comfort thing and just adoring God's creation. I mean, his creation is an artwork of itself. So the use of clouds is basically to convey that. Thank you. Yeah. That's lovely. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. A uh, special thanks to uh, Jacqueline, uh, to Mary, to Sarah and Winifred for all that you've shared with us. Uh, it's been a real joy to, uh, to, to listen to you and to interact to, with you. As I think I mentioned, this is our final webinar of 2022, and, um, but we will be, um, uh, this is a recording of this we'll be making available. And so look out on social media uh, so you can flag this up for others who haven't been able to, to be present with us today. Uh, there will be a chance to, uh, to listen in on the conversation. Um, Let's draw to a close. Mary, would you offer a closing prayer for us as, before we say goodbye to everybody? Yeah, really glad to do that. Thank you. I wonder whether we can just be quiet for a moment and just um, let some of all of that conversation settle, and then I'll pray.
Creator God, we thank you for all that you have made that inspires us and gives us joy and reveals more of who you are. And we thank you that you have made us in your own image to be people of imagination and emotion, as well as intellect. We pray that you would inspire us to use our creativity and the creativity of others to be reconciled to you and to one another and to ourselves. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit who goes before us in this work. Amen. 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 Oh man, that was really lovely, Mary. Thank you, a great way for us to draw to a close. So uh, thank you to everybody who's, who's been able to join us. Um, uh, real joy to have you with us. Uh, so glad you could be present in person um, and we'll give you a chance to sort of say goodbye. You're welcome to come off mute and, uh, and say goodbye. In fact, I'll, what I'll do is I'll stop the sharing and uh, anybody who's still with us can uh, is welcome just to, to come off and uh, to wave us goodbye and. Uh, Share a word of goodbye if you'd like to before you leave.